And uh, the next step is the keynote address by Angel Durant. Uh, she is a principal analyst nickel for Wood Mackenzie. Good morning and welcome to this year's Pater Nickel Conference. Unfortunately, I will not be joining you in person today, but I'm hopeful that next year will be a different story and I just might be able to get over the West Australian border. Who knows? Today, I'm going to provide you with Wood Mackenzie's view of the nickel market and how we expect supply, demand and prices to change over the short to longer term. Even though many of you here today are very much focused on exploration or production of nickel concentrate and ore, it is very clear that nickel prices are being buoyed by the energy transition, which for nickel has meant ever increasing interest in the electric vehicle supply chain and production of nickel sulfate to feed EV batteries. If we look at the last 18 months of price data, we can see that some of the metals we cover that are part of the energy transition story, namely copper, cobalt, aluminium and nickel, have climbed significantly from March 2020 through to September this year. For nickel in particular, we can see that after recording a low of $11,055 on March the 23rd, 2020, prices increased steadily for the next 12 months. However, as you can see from the red circle here on the left-hand side, in early March, prices dropped by a staggering 20% following the announcement by China's Xinxian that it would convert some of its MPI lines over to MAT at its Morawali Industrial Park or the IMIP in Indonesia. This sent the market into a spin, breaking the previous view that the nickel market would be oversupplied with MPI and we had no idea where we would be going to find all the nickel for batteries. Xinxian had effectively come up with the answer. The nickel required for the battery route would in part come from MAT. And this is actually something we said would be announced in our things to look for in 2021 report on the nickel market, which we released in January. Since Xingshan's announcement, nickel prices have, however, largely returned to their upward trajectory, supported not only by the EV story, but genuinely solid fundamentals. Record high demand, tight supply and record low stocks. All of this has contributed to considerable growth in share prices for many of you in the room today. Going back to our index date of March 23rd, 2020, IGO is up around 160%, Western Area is up 78%, Minkor by about 215%, Poseidon by almost 300 and Panoramic by 110%. I imagine all of your investors are very happy at the moment. So given the excitement around batteries and EVs, I thought we would cover our views on this first before heading to the market fundamentals. If we consider nickel consumption by first use, stainless remains the market's main consumer, currently accounting for around 70% of total consumption. However, looking out to 2040, this share drops to 53% as battery precursors for EVs and energy storage become increasingly more important. In 2020, we estimate that battery precursors for electric vehicles accounted for 7% of total consumption. But by 2040, we expect that this share would have climbed to 30%. In the 20 year period, we are forecasting consumption of nickel to more than double from 2.4 million tonnes in 2020 to 4.9 million tonnes in 2040, meaning that nickel consumed in stainless will reach 2.5 million tonnes compared with 1.7 million tonnes in 2020, and nickel consumed in battery precursors will reach 1.5 million tonnes, compared with only 177 kilotons in 2020. Bottom line is that we are anticipating solid growth in demand for battery precursors above all other first use sectors. This view is supported by our projections for electric vehicle car sales over the same 20 year period. We currently forecast annual sales of passenger EVs to exceed 49 million in 2020, compared to around 3 million in 2021, and 2 million in 2020, pardon me. These sales are represented by the dark blue bars in the chart on the left-hand side. In terms of battery chemistry and looking to the chart on the right, we expect that 
the current dominance of 532 and 662 in NMC will give way to high nickel 811 types by 2025. As the chart illustrates, the NMC 811 and the LFP or lithium iron phosphate types will provide the majority of required gigawatt hours for EV batteries from 2030 onwards. In fact, by 2020, we expect that all NMC batteries in use will be 811. At this point, high nickel and lithium ion type batteries will dominate. And we expect that the split between non-nickel LFP, NCA and NMC batteries will not change greatly over time, over the long term. Obviously, battery developments are continuing apace. And in the next 10 years or so, it is quite possible that other configurations may find favour. But in terms of what is commercially applied right now, this is how we see the market developing. And in terms of nickel, the progressive dominance of 811 will boost consumption, but this will be countered by lower intensity of use as battery pack size gets smaller due to increasing energy density. Looking at demand for battery precursors or nickel sulfate on a regional basis, we can see that China will be the main consumer in the years to 2030, which is shown by the yellow area in the chart on the left. In 2021, we estimate China's demand will total 211 kilotons of nickel in precursor and increase to almost 700 kilotons in 2030. In terms of supply, we can see from the chart on the right hand side that nickel sulfate in batteries for EVs will be the largest consuming sector, accounting for over 900 kilotons of nickel by 2030. Coming back to this year, we expect that nickel and sulfate production will actually start to exceed demand and that this will continue until 2025, which is actually shown here by the small grey line on the right hand side. And this is the point in 2025, which there will be a need for new investment in or new investment in sulfate capacity. This increase um, in supply this year is largely due to Singshan's commitment to supplying an additional 75 kilotons of nickel in mat to the battery supply chain from October uh, from its converted MPI lines at Morawali in Indonesia, as I mentioned earlier. As well as the commencement of production from the H-Power facilities in Indonesia, one of these, uh, PT Halmahera Lijend, commenced shipping MHP to China in June, July this year, and the other two HPL plants are expected to commence operating later in the year. While we expect, or, or, or actually towards next year, while we expect once these shipments commence for sulfate prices in China to decline, indeed with Ligand already actually commencing, they've already started to fall. But for nickel, the fundamentals remain very positive and we expect prices to remain around current levels in 2022. While China will dominate production of nickel sulfate for the foreseeable future, as you're all aware, BHP at Quinana has commenced production of nickel sulfate, which is shown here in the green area on the left-hand side, and Indonesia has also become a producer of sulfate in 2021. Over the next five years, we estimate that nickel sulfate will be sourced from laterites at around 37%, sulfide deposits around 40%, so similar volumes from both, and dissolution will account for around 15% of nickel sulfate supply and recycling around 8%. The big consideration here is what part recycling will play over time. But for now, let me take you back to the fundamentals. Our current outlook for the short term nickel market is one of tightness. Following the stagnation of demand in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, demand has surged with most of the leading nickel consuming regions returning to their 2019 levels. We currently estimate demand to increase by a whopping 17.3% in 2021 to total 2.8 million tonnes, firmly bringing the market back into balance following last year's surplus of more than 150,000 tonnes. The rebound in demand coupled with the future need for nickel and electrification has supported high nickel prices throughout 2021, and we currently estimate an annual average of $18,475 per tonne. The strength in prices will continue in 2022 before falling, as small surpluses build over 2023 and 2024. 
The strength in this current two-year period, however, has been buoyed by very strong Chinese demand for nickel and precursors for rechargeable batteries, as we looked at earlier, but also due to the reduction in supply expected from Indonesian MPI. Consequently, from 2025, the market will experience a six-year period of price supporting deficits, averaging around 60 kilotons per annum through to 2030. Looking at our stainless demand analysis in more detail, we estimate that in 2021, production will increase by 14% compared with last year, uh, with China expected to account for 58% of global melted output. The country's stainless sector is still expanding with output forecasts to rise from 35 million tonnes in 2021 to 45 million tonnes in 2030. The other country experiencing growth is Indonesia, where DeLong Obsidian is ramping up its second line and Singshan is operating well above capacity, which is currently around 3 million tonnes of stainless. Indonesia is he now heading for 5.5 million tonnes of stainless melt capacity by 2022, which is remarkable given the country didn't have an industry in 2016. China's production of stainless is very much leveraged to MPI. We can see from the grey bars in this chart that in 2019 and 2020, China started to favour imported MPI for its stainless production rather than producing stainless, uh, rather than producing MPI itself in China. The volume of imported Indonesia MPI almost doubled over this period and the move to import more Indonesian MPI has meant that China's requirement for both class one nickel, which is now down 20, 248 kilotons per annum since two, 2016, as well as imported ferro-nickel, which is down 20% in 2021, have both fallen significantly. However, despite these decreasing volumes, we expect that Chinese ferro-nickel imports will start increasing again from 2022, as Indonesian ore is converted to match for batteries rather than MPI, as we've been discussing in the previous slides. Meaning that there will be less MPI available to import uh, for China. And depending on the price, this will determine if in fact more Western ferro-nickel is imported or China starts to use more scrap, um, if nothing else, to support a move towards a greener economy. Looking to the other side of our supply demand balance and considering production, the two charts above highlight growth in both mined and refined output since 2019. We can clearly see that MPI, mostly from Indonesia, has been driving this produ the production increases at both the mine and the smelter or refinery level, uh, prompting double-digit growth in laterite ore production in both 2019 and 2021. Overall, we expect global mine production to increase by 17% in 20 this year and refined output to increase by 11% compared with 2020. Over the next few years, MPI production growth will be supported, will continue to be supported by developments in Indonesia. And we estimate that MPI production in Indonesia will increase to around 1.1 million tonnes by 2024 and will remain around this level until other MPI proje projects are developed. It should be noted that restrictions on MPI capacity are, however, possible. Earlier this quarter, Indonesia's Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources announced that it was considering a plan to restrict the construction of new MPI and ferro-nickel smelters. The proposal seeks to optimise the use of nickel resources for higher value products, which in turn would increase royalty revenues. The government wishes to develop a more complete value chain with the production of more stainless steel as well as nickel sulphate. For the present, this is for discussion, but any restriction on further MPI production in Indonesia would be viewed very positively from a price perspective. However, given the number of safeguarding and anti-dumping duties now imposed on Indonesian stainless steel, one can debate whether there would even be a, a viable market for stainless from new projects. When we compare the amount of MPI produced versus the amount likely to be consumed by Indonesia's two main stainless steel melt shops, it is clear that there will be considerably more MPI available for export, principally to China's owner smelters, or stainless melters rather. So the Indonesian government could view this in two ways. Do we continue to permit the export of a low value added product to support China's stainless sector? 
Or do we place some restrictions on MPI exports and encourage further direct redirection of these nickel units into the automat route for batteries, serving you know, the Indonesian domestic battery cell manufacturing plants? The first investment in those downstream plants, like by conglomerates uh, or Korean conglomerates, um, Hyundai and LGES, have just been announced and will be using Indonesian produced MHP. And it must be tempting for the Indonesian authorities to press further downstream investment. It will also be good diplomacy to avoid generating problems among those Chinese investors who rely on low cost Indonesian MPI for their own China-based stainless melt shops. So now that we've considered the fundamentals of supply and demand, I want to leave you with a few considerations for now and the future. Given the consecutive deficits that we mentioned at the start of the fundamental section we are for, that we are forecasting over the latter half of the decade, we expect that recycling will also become increasingly important for nickel. In fact, we'd be so bold to suggest that the saving for nickel supply or future nickel supply could be a redirection of investment funds towards recycling. The inherent qualities of recycling make it attractive, a potential lower environmental footprint combined with the social message of moving what has hitherto been material going into landfill. There are several new entrants in this field already, and with the pace it's been picking up since early 2020. From collection and processing of spent batteries through to the reusable products they will make, there are many differences between the different players' intentions but most share a commonality in their small size, typically less than 10 kilotons per annum of nickel in black mass or sulfate, and a potential for scaling up by a factor of three. While China already accounts for the bulk of spent battery materials being processed and will remain the market leader, recycling is gaining traction outside of China. We are seeing high rates of investment in new plants across Europe and the USA, as well as Asia. One of the most recent announcements has come from South Korean conglomerates of Hyundai Motor uh, Corp and LEGS, who will start building a 10 gigawatt NMCA battery cell factory in Indonesia from the end of this year. The partners intend to take MHP from the new Obi nickel smelter in North Maluku province in Eastern Indonesia. A subsequent project is for the precursor cathode active material or PCAMs CAM and a battery recycling plant in central Java province. In other words, new players from the downstream nickel consumer business segment or first use chemicals and end use autos are obtaining their own funds to guarantee raw material supply, bypassing conventional industry names and financing routes. And flipping to something almost completely different, as you are well aware, uh, producers and consumers alike are becoming more concerned with ESG and carbon dioxide emissions. The need to produce clean, green, sustainably sourced nickel has become increasingly important. With this in mind, Wood Mackenzie developed an emissions benchmarking tool, which is where I've generated the data for this slide and the next. The carbon emissions inten intensity tool illustrates that MPI producers in Indonesia are high on the emissions curve, largely due to the intensive use of coal for power generation, uh, 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 pardon me, uh, coal for large power generation. Large integrated sulfide producers, however, sit much lower down on the curve. And here we have highlighted both Vale and Nerilsk as examples. And not to disappoint, in Australia, most producers, both sulfide and laterite, are closer to the lower end of the CO2 emissions curve and sit well below the weighted annual average, which I'm sure you will be happy to know. These positions will become increasingly important as consumers and investors look to source, um, look to the source of the nickel supplying their electric vehicle batteries and energy storing energy storage requirements of the future. So to conclude, and to take us back to our nickel demand balance and a few key takeaways. Based on current market fundamentals, we expect that the deficits running through to 2030 will support annual average prices approaching $19,440 per tonne or $8.80 per pound in the old money by 2026. 
followed by even higher prices of around $21,000 through to 2029. By then, four straight years of metal inventory drawdowns will shrink global stocks towards 100 days of consumption, which is by 3031. Uh, 2031 rather, <laughs> a level not seen since 2005 when prices also averaged $19,980 per tonne. Primary refined supply through to 2031, which includes base case and probable projects, which is shown here in the light and dark blue areas, will struggle to average annual growth of around 2.5% a year, virtually all coming before 2027 as well. Therefore, by 2026, the market will need to find new nickel, either from our extensive list of probable projects or possible projects as well, or from elsewhere. By 2020, 2031, the requirement for nickel from these sources is estimated to be around 570 kilotons here, as we can see by the arrows on the chart, which will expand to 976 kilotons by 2040. I think it's worth pointing out at this juncture that nickel prices are currently sitting at around $18,000 to $19,000 per tonne, or at least they were uh, when we recorded. <laughs> and that, and at, even at this level, we have not seen banks putting their hands in their pockets to finance new projects, which signals that there is still much caution despite the optimism around EVs and nickel consumption growth. And with that, I will thank you and open up for questions.